the first ever Finnish player to win on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Niklas Antilla now joins Tour Life for the first time. Welcome, brother. Sounds good. Thank you, boys. I was going to say, how's that intro sound? Very nice. That has been my dream for like five, four years now. And it's finally true. So I still can't believe it. But I think I, I started to like understand what happened and move forward. Yeah, that's one of those cool ones that will stick with you for the rest of time and even like in the future, you know, 40 years, 50 years from now, if another Finnish player starts making moves on the tour, everyone will look back to you as the first. So you're kind of submitted into history there winning that one. So yeah. uh, very, very cool. Um, I want to jump in first to just kind of get your mindset because this isn't this isn't new to you having a chance to win. You've been in positions multiple times and multiple times you've fallen just short. Yeah. What what was the feeling going into the lead round? Did you have any feelings like hey, this is different? Yeah, uh, obviously I was second uh, last week in Waco as well. So I kind of fell short again and I felt like all right, we had one more second place again. And I was just telling myself that I just can't keep like being second all the time. If I get like any more chances, I want to dig deep and like take all my chances and use them as my advantage. And uh, uh, of course, I missed the pattern 14 again. Um, and I was feeling like, is it happening again? But I was able to make those two parts in the in the last two holes and win it like if I think like how I want to win I want to win like by making a 35 four or so that was super nice yeah it was very impressive what you did uh we'll, we'll get to that in a second I don't want to jump too far ahead because some crazy stuff happened in a very very short period of time you I, I I'm trying to get the timeline just right and Yuli or uh, either one of you I guess jump in you got a uh, warning for excessive time, which has now happened twice. Back-to-back -back tournaments, lead card, Ganon Burr at Waco, and now you at the Open at Austin. And then did you end up missing a kind of a short putt shortly after that? Yeah, I got the time warning on round one. I think it was hole eight uh, on my second shot. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Uh, of course, I was playing a bit faster after that, and I was kind of rushing my shots, I felt like. Uh, and I missed like a, maybe like 14, 15 foot putt on, on hole nine. So, yeah, it was in my mind that I need to play fast, and I didn't want to even come close to 30 seconds and any of my shots. But, yeah, and then on hole, on hole 10, I played one hole in 10 seconds, so that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so for those that didn't see it, we'll actually pull up the clip here in a second. Not yet right now, size, because I do want to get your thoughts on uh, on that. But this brings up my like pace of play situation. I, I'm curious to see what you, your thoughts are on it. I think the 30 second rule is one of the dumbest rules we play. And I'll tell you why. You could have all four people on your card take 29 seconds for every single shot. They have a five foot putt. They take 29 seconds. You could do that, and there would be no rules that you could call against this card. They're playing by the rules, and they would yeah. they would back up the entire course. It would be an absolute nightmare to play behind a card like that. So like what you just said, you start playing a lot quicker, and you took 10 seconds to play one hole. Do you think? Do you like the way the rule is currently set or would you like to make it to where hey there's certain shots that i'm going to need a little bit more time but when i get to a 20 foot putt i'm not going to take 30 seconds i'm going to take 10 and that's going to kind of catch us back up to how fast we should be playing yeah i think um especially in this golf if you go to like a deep rough uh you will easily take like 45 seconds on a shot but then again if you have like a 250 foot high shot, like nothing on your way. I think you should take like only 10, 15 seconds to maybe look at the wind and stuff. Um, 
I don't know what I think about like the 30 second rule. I think it's all right, but there is definitely like situations where it's it's really bad as well. And uh, for me, it's just like because I got the time warning from like um, DJPT staff member, not a player. Yeah. And then I was not the only one using like over 30 seconds on one shot. And the same guy was there for the whole round. And I was the only guy who got the warning. So I think that's that's like, I felt a bit dumb about that because especially with the same guy being like following us on the, on the whole round. Yeah, I think the clip that, uh, or the, the shot that you ended up getting it, I think you ended up taking roughly around 50 seconds. And yeah. it's like, the rule is, if, if we're really calling the rules out here, like you said, any any time over 30 seconds, should be called whether it's 31 32 or uh, a minute and a half and gannon was on last week and he was talking how he was asking the guy like when does my 30 seconds start like i would like to know when my 30 seconds and the guy couldn't give him a clear answer and i think that's a big issue too a lot of people are looking specifically on how long you know how long are you taking to throw your shot right are you doing a bunch of pump fakes and my thing is like I actually don't think that's the big issue here. I think the big issue is how long are you staying on the T pad and talking before yeah. the, the next person's throwing? How long is it taking you to walk the 450 yeah. feet to your T shot? Like, are you yeah. just walking the park doing this? Because I can get to my T shot in 20 seconds and there might be some people taking a minute and that's, yeah. those are massive gaps. Um, Yuli, what are your thoughts on, on how, you know, do you like the 30 second rule or do you want, do you think what needs to be changed? Cause no, we're I seeing it now I, affecting multiple tournaments. Yeah. I can't stand it. Um, one of the things is I think we should all get like a minute. I think there should be a minute because then it wouldn't even matter. And I think you should get an extension of your minute as well. And I've had a lot of pushback of that be people being like a minute. That's crazy. And I'm like, yeah, but people are taking a minute anyway. That's my whole thing. Like, I don't have mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with taking 30 seconds to throw. I'm a fairly quick player. But there's times when the wind picks up and I'm putting where I, I'll use a little extra mm -hmm. time. And I don't get called for it because I'm typically a, a quick player. And I'm not sitting there counting. Like, I have an internal clock that's like, okay, this is taking a little bit. This is taking a little while. Um, I should probably pull the trigger, and then I do. You know, once that internal clock is like, okay, I'm taking the excessive time, I have that. I think every player has that. And if it was a minute, we wouldn't have to worry about it. And then it comes down to what I think if you had a minute, what it should be is here's how long it should take you to play around if your card is not keeping up with that pace of play, your card gets the warning. Your whole card. Like, hey, you guys, you guys need to pick it up as a card. And then if it's just one player, you can be like, well, it's him. And then it's like, well, it doesn't matter. You guys, you guys need to keep going. You guys need to get, keep up the pace or whatever. And a, a lot of people don't like that too, because it could be just one player, but at the same time, it's all about pace of play. So what is the correct pace of play for your card to keep moving? So you're not backing up the whole entire place. If you get in the woods and you have a tough lie, it would if you don't take the proper amount of time to find the right route to know where the basket is to know where your layup is it could take triple the time you hit a branch right in front of you rushing your shot and now all of a sudden you're <laughs> back in the woods again and now you take another 30 seconds you don't yeah. have time to go look out you throw it out of bounds you rethrow you throw out of bounds again all of a sudden you just took four minutes <laughs> because you didn't take your time you know what i mean and that's yeah. something that people aren't thinking about but that's that's for real. When you kick really wildly in the woods, especially on a course like Waco, like you're in a spot that you have no, like no clue what's going on and you've never been there. It's not like people are just marching into the woods being like, Oh, if I hit this tree, I'm going to go 50 feet in here. And now I got to figure out how to get out. So I think there's a lot of different, um, different things, but I think what it comes down to is pace of play for, for, the whole tournament, not just individual players. Yeah, Individual players should be a, a, allowed to have an allotted amount of time so that they can best perform, best perform and give the people who are watching at this point, because that's what it is. It's a product that people need to be able to pay attention to and see and perform and get the best for whatever they're paying for. And the two things I was going to add to that, Nicholas is like for that, that, that specific instance where you took, you know, 50 seconds or whatever, 
if you would have sprinted off the T pad and gotten to your disc, right? I think the 50 seconds would have not slowed down. Like by the time you're throwing, the card is probably just showing up. So I think that's another thing is like, if you know, like you're going to be the first one to throw on your card, you, you had the worst tee shot. You're going to be the first one to throw and you're the last one off the tee pad. And you're like slowly getting, mm -hmm. that's, that's a major issue. Now I did want to ask you about the caddy situation. Did you have a caddy during that round? Uh, round one, I didn't have a caddy. I only had caddy for uh, the last round. Okay. And was that Tomas? Yes. Okay. I think that also plays a role because I think when we're watching it live, when you're, I can see your brain and I'm, I'm trying to speculate what you're going through. Oh, is mm -hmm. he trying to throw like an overstable, like a uh, flex shot to like flat? Or is he thinking about maybe throwing a forehand? Like I'm kind of trying to understand what you're going through, but because you don't have a caddy there and you're not verbally talking it out, I think it feels like a long 50 seconds. Yeah. If you would have had Tomas there and you guys are talking and you're like, pulling one disc out and he's like, ah, I don't like, I think for a viewer that 50 seconds goes by super fast. And then honestly too, like I, I think that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I want to hear that. And so I think that's something too, with the coverage of maybe when we do get caddies, maybe when we do get mics to where we can hear you guys like that to me is I would love to hear 40 seconds of you breaking that shot down. Like, I think that yeah. would be fascinating to, to everyone. Mm -hmm. So, um, We'll see. We'll see how it goes. It's it's it is going to be an issue because we've had we've had a lot of these tournaments now where we're almost playing glow golf. Uh, did you have a glow disc in your bag just in case? Yeah, I had multiple. I had like three at least. Okay, so you were prepared. <laughs> I, yeah, I want to uh, say one thing to the thirty second rule. I think that the problem is not if somebody is using like thirty five seconds on one shot. That there is some people that are slowing like moving like so slowly on a course like there has been so many times that people throw their tee shots and then we walk to the disc and then i have been by his disc for like one minute and the same guy is still on the tee by drinking something or eating something or talking to somebody i think that's the problem not not like the 35 seconds on one shot yeah and i'll put it out there i've played with you a couple times now you are by far not a slow disc golfer so mm -hmm. i just want to stop that narrative i don't think that narrative is starting but uh yeah. if, if there are people out there being like oh he got a time violation he's slow no no no, he's not he, mm -hmm. he plays very quick and uh what i like to call like ready disc golf of where you know hey it's my turn i'm gonna throw and we're not sitting around waiting um all right did you happen to see the sports center clip yeah, yeah, I saw it. Okay, and I heard it. All right, we're gonna play it here because I want to get your reaction. Oh, that link. Uh, how much time do you need for it to just pull up? Oh, we don't have a way of just pulling it up real quick. Okay. Oh. Um. Okay. It doesn't have to be like super nice. You can just pull it up literally on like if, uh, like if you want, it's just on Twitter. I, I, I just texted it to the group. Um, all right, we'll, we'll talk, we'll move on to something else and then, uh, we'll come back to that. Cause I do, I do want to get, I want everyone to hear it first and then get your reaction on it. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's fast forward a little bit to the final round. Let's go back to the final round real quick. Hole number six. That was one of those holes where the way I thought about it, I thought it was a very well-designed hole because of the shaping of it. And if you weren't able to get clean off the fairway, it was very, very tough to get your second shot to the basket. Were you trying, like, were you thinking about getting to the basket on that second shot there? Cause it did look like you threw a fast disc. Yeah. Um, Thinking about it now, I made a dumb decision on that one. Uh, I was going with like PD2, which is like 12 speed driver. I was saying like, not go for the basket, but like skip it like behind the corner and then have like a 120 feet to the basket for easy par. I should have just like went with slow disc and just played for like 220 feet. Um, but yeah, 
that was a double bug and that one not ideal and that made me like work harder for the for the last holes. Do you like that kind of course design though of where it's not all like gas? I feel like a lot of courses we play on tour and I mean you saw it on this course too a little bit, right? When the wind was down, Gannon shot the course record at 14 under. Yeah. You had some really good rounds uh as well. You were pretty consistent from round to round, but like, do you feel like all of a sudden the first, I mean, that those first five holes, right? It's like gas. Like you got yeah. a birdie, you got to try to eagle hole five. And then you get to this hole here and you throw one bad shot and you're like, well, I got to still try to bird. Like, is that, was that a hard transition in the moment for you to be like, wait a second. Like if I just chip, chip, get a par and move on, all things are fine. Yeah, that was that was weird because I felt like, as you said, first five holes are like pretty simple, nothing too special on those, and then hole six and hole eight. I think you need to like almost like survive those holes, and you are happy with a par on those holes. And as you can see, like the double bogey happened so fast. Yeah, I and, did. Uh, and then again after hole eight, I feel like the end of the course is like pretty simple, and mm -hmm. then maybe seventeen, eighteen are like more stuff so it's like mentally mentally pretty hard to go like first play easy, easy for five holes and then go to woods and then come back and you need to be strong yeah i didn't really think about it at the time when we were playing but now looking back and talking about it like it's actually a really interesting design of where you got a score really good and then they throw like a speed bump at you yeah and then you got a score really good again and then at the end it's like Cause you can, you can rattle off. I mean, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, you can Eagle. Like you can rattle off a whole bunch right there. And then you get to 17, 18. And if you like slip up a little bit, all of a sudden you can take some big numbers. So yeah. uh, it ended up playing kind of well, I guess. Yeah. And I think that for example, I think I had a six on whole six and uh, Joey on my card had a three. So that was, three strokes on one hole and then hole eight he took a double bogey and i buried it so it happened right back. Super, super fast yeah yeah hey that just shows all the commentators out there this is everyone's big pet peeve when they're listening to commentators uh mm -hmm. not you yuli the live commentators it's okay to not have to like be the first one to say the tournament's over like they, it's like a weird, like contest. Like they want, like they want to have, be the first one to be like, Oh, that's it. Nicholas is done. <laughs> like as soon as you hit that tree and you go, OB, it's like, well, he's done. He's got no chance to win. He's completely out of the tournament. It's like, yeah. hold on, man. Like we're not playing these tournaments where, you know, everyone's shooting 16 under there's, there are some, you know, score separation here. So hold your horses. I thought, I thought you bounced <laughs> back from that, uh, that double early. I mean, your round could have been, you know, could have gone the exact opposite direction. Yeah. Um, so that was very impressive. Okay. I think we do have the clip now. So for those that didn't see it, this is, uh, uh, your ACE on whole, uh, 10 and it made sports center top 10 plays. Let's give it a watch on number right. six disc golf. Linda. Okay. This is the pro tour. Uh, Nicholas and What the heck is this on hole 10, 315 feet out. It's like the pickleball and, of golf. Exactly. <laughs> Just don't take up any real golf courses. Yeah, exactly. Got 150 oh points. He sits well, in third place. Good for him. Okay. So first reaction I want from you is like, let's let's act like you saw that in a bar and you couldn't hear the commentary what was your reaction when you found out that you were you made sports center top 10. i'm assuming this is the first time uh that was awesome that's actually my second time i think oh. i made it i was also number six in 2022 for finals when i made the uh, long eagle uh on oh yes okay 15 maybe Yes, yes. So that was a time. sick shot. Very cool. Okay. I yeah. didn't know that made Sports Center. Very nice. So, yeah, of course, that's really awesome. Uh, I felt like I was pretty lucky, though. It was like too much right, and I was going OB by a mile, but I'm lucky that I went in and I went one by one. So, that was important. <laughs> I think that's literally how all three aces, like if they didn't hit the basket, there was going to be 50 feet right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's talk about the commentary now. So uh, I'm blanking on who the commentators, I think it's, um, gosh, I have to remember who, what her name is. She's been on ESPN for a very, very long time. 
both of them have been. Mm-hmm. What are what are your thoughts? And you know, it wasn't the most positive commentary on that shot. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I don't really care. But when I think about it more, I think it makes me feel a little bit sad because if this coffee is somebody's like passion and they really like to do it and then they hear like somebody talking about it in that way, I don't, I don't feel very good about that. Uh, maybe that's the only thing that I have to say about that. Pretty sad. Uh, it's Linda Cohen, by the way, that thank you. Thank you to Brian for uh, letting me know. Yeah. I, I'll touch on that real quick. And then Yuli, I want you to hop in. Cause I, I'm curious what your thoughts are. I think sometimes like it, this kind of just puts in perspective a little bit because we get in that disc golf bubble. Sometimes mm-hmm. it kind of puts in perspective a little bit of just like there are, you know, these massive top four sports. And, and really, if you're not even in one of the top four sports, you could still be a huge sport. Yeah. You still like there is still this kind of weird commentary towards a lot of sports that are much, much bigger than disc golf. The way I view it though, cause I know like, you know, you, you seemed like you were a little sad about it and there's a bunch of people on Twitter and Instagram that are upset. The way I view it is you're still getting disc golf in front of new eyeballs. And, yeah. and would it be better if they were like, Holy cow, this sport looks incredible. This is the game. Yes. That obviously would be better, but someone still allowed it to get sports center top 10. So at a certain point, like we still have to be grateful that we got that spot. Now, what yep. do we do to be able to try to get Because ultimate Frisbee had the same kind of stigma of like, Oh, that's like a stoner sport. That's what a bunch of like people that smoke weed and go play Frisbee do. Yeah. And it took, I think it took a long time. And even still, some people think that I think disc golf is still very young, but y- Yuli, what are your thoughts on it? I think it's like uh hit and miss really with who's, who's announcing it, what they had for breakfast yes. that day. <laughs> yes. It really is because they're seeing this and they, and they have to come up with something on the fly. Mm-hmm. And that's sometimes tough, especially with something you probably haven't seen before. Um, there's been times where I've made the top 10 and it was awesome. And there's been times when they're made complete fun of me. So it, <laughs> it, one of the clips, they said that I threw it 427 yards which is like the world record, which is pretty cool. Ace. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, that was hilarious, but they like really hyped it up And another one. They're like, uh, what is this uh, Frisbee golf? And they like kind of made fun of me in, in the thing. And I'm with you, Brody, the more eyes that are on it, the better. But I also think we got to give the commentators a little break because they have a tough job of all of a sudden they don't probably know what's going to pop no, up and they just have just to pops come right up, up. Mm-hmm. whatever comes to their mind. And so if I'm doing that and let's say it's like, the throwing marbles world championship. And I have to commentate on something I've never <laughs> seen before. I probably, whatever comes to mind comes to mind. I don't think we should take it too seriously. Probably. I don't know. I mean, I haven't watched sports in a really long time, but I don't know if they do it like they used to. They basically would film one. And then I think they would re-record a couple of times. So like you would get a different iteration of, and the top 10 throughout the day would sometimes change too. Like some would drop off and new clips from that day yep. would pop in. And so you would sometimes hear uh, the same person. They're now seeing it for the third time. And so I don't know if we have any other clips of that, Nicholas, but you might have another clip from that. That is a little bit more positive that maybe yeah. you can put in your, your memory bank, hopefully <laughs> for you. Um yes. But, uh, but no, very cool. I mean, it's always very cool to see disc golf on TV like that. Um, and, uh, whether it's in a positive light or not, there are some kids I'm sure out there watching that to be like, Oh, that looks sick. I want to go try that. So very, very cool to see. All right. Let's jump ahead now to hole 14. Now, you you know, you're not going to end up playing the next two holes, which are, Pretty, pretty much most of us are, are thinking those are birdie holes. You're going from hole 14 straight to 17 to 18. You have, you play hole 14. Absolutely. Perfect. You throw a great tee shot, put yourself in a good position. You throw a great up shot to give yourself, what are we calling it? 15, 18 feet. 
maybe 15, 14. It's, it was close. I was trying to give you the Eight. bit. I was trying to give you the bit out there, Nick Glass. You could have been like, ah, 18, 20. Um, it was close. Now, did you did you do one or two extra pumps there? Like, was that a little bit of a longer routine than your he normal did putting eight routine? Extra pumps. Let's not give him any more breaks. <laughs> <laughs> did yeah, you stand just, over that putt a little longer than you would normally stand over a fifteen footer? Uh, yeah, a little bit. There was uh, some people moving behind, and that's not a, like an excuse for that one. It's like fifteen foot putt. We should make it every time. Uh, I knew the scores before that putt, and I knew that if I was going to birdie out, uh, I was going to win by one, I think, at that point, uh, if Kai was going to birdie 18. So I knew the situation, and um, yeah, it kind of remember, reminded me of what happened in Winthrop in 2022. Uh, it was actually the same hole as well, hole 14, yep. I think. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that, to me, like, the oh, way oh, you... What? Oh, what, yeah, went through, what was going through your mind? Was it the pressure? And so you had all those thoughts, you had the people behind there and you're sitting there over it, trying to obviously block the negative thoughts out for a second. At what point? Cause I feel like people who are listening don't understand like the thought process mm -hmm. that goes into situations like that. Like at what point were you like, okay, this is, I got to pull the trigger. And where was your mind at once you did that? Was it in the right place or was it just like you rushed it at that point because you didn't take long enough? Because it's okay to sit there and mm -hmm. do 50 pumps as long as you make it. Yeah. Um, I think I I took like a great amount of time. Uh, I wasn't rushing anything or, or stuff like that. I just felt like my head was empty uh, at that time. I felt like mm -hmm. I was... I didn't have any nerves, but I wasn't like excited or anything about about anything really at that point i felt like i was just like in that moment but at the same time i was somewhere else uh, mm -hmm. it was it was weird now walking off that green what's going through your head as, as you make the walk the whole 17 first off already kind of a weird situation right because we're normally walking uh much shorter distance and then off to the right so now we're doing something that we haven't done where we're yeah. walk we're skipping two holes and walking to another hole what what are the thoughts running through your head with two holes to play and after looking at scores and knowing hey if i birdie uh the last three holes i win taking a par there and i want to add to that knowing that there's three holes gone now being the leader to start the tournament, that could be like, oh, sweet, no more holes. Like, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have the lead and we're getting rid of holes. That's a good thing for me. But at this point, you're pro was there any thought of like, dang it, I wish I had those holes back? Just um, to add that question. Yeah. They really took away like the two of the, maybe the easiest holes on the course, uh, 50 and 16. Those were pretty simple holes. Um for me, 17 is like su surprisingly easy because I like to throw those flex lines and I, I felt pretty comfortable on that, on that one. Um, we got to hang out there, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking before you came on. I was like, that is my least favorite shot to throw on disc golf. Yeah. I just feel like <laughs> I'm just like smacking something over stable. And I feel like I almost never missed those shots, uh, honestly, but yeah, I threw it to like 50 feet. It wasn't the greatest shot ever, but. I gave myself a look and that's the, that's the number one thing in those situations. Did you feel like you pulled that tee shot? Cause as I was doing commentary, it looked like you threw it and you, your eyes were like on it, like right away, like, Oh no, I pulled it a little bit. Or did you peer it? Um, it was a little bit too much, right. And a little bit too low. I think it was, a, was like a bit higher. It would have some time to like come back and maybe skip a little bit more on the left. Um, it was a good line, but just a, a bit too low, I think. Okay. Now the putt you made on 17, that's, that's got to go down as one of the nastiest putts we've seen in a while. Uh, you know, it brings me back to like Paul McBeth's putt that he made at worlds on hole 17, um, where he's just cashing. I mean, his, his putt on at USCGC on hole set, we've seen some big putts before, after missing that short one on the previous hole, was it looking back at it? Was it actually nice to have like a 50 footer instead of having like another 20 footer right again, right away? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I think I would have taken the twenty footer again, uh, much rather. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was so far, and uh, also it was pretty dark at that time, so I didn't see the basket as good as I, as good as I maybe wanted to. But uh, I knew that if I want to have a chance to win the tournament, uh, I need to make that pass and because we didn't have any time for playoff or stuff because it was getting so dark so fast. Had they mentioned any of that to you guys during the round? Uh, like, were you guys getting updates on what they were going to do? Because so many of you guys were so close mm -hmm. together. Uh, no, I didn't know anything. All I knew that uh, we were going to play 15 holes and that's it. I wonder if they would have just like brought out some like cars to hole one and just thrown the headlights on the basket. Yeah. That could have been like, electric. Yeah, but... Even if we like tied with Kyle, it would have been like two winners, maybe, if that even a thing. Oh, yeah. you think they would have yeah. done co co champion? Yeah, and that's like they did with one. Ricky and Calvin that one year. Mm. At yeah, Ledgestone, I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to have like my first win to be like no. co champion. No, no. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Let, let's uh, let's go to hole eighteen. So you birdie that hole. You're standing, you know, you're walking to the tee pad. Are you looking at scores? Are you seeing w where you stand? Yes, I know the situation. And also, uh, I was playing with Gannon. Uh, he told me that, hey, man, he's like, we are always doing this thing. Hey, man, <laughs> hey, hey, man, you need to birdie 18 to win. Let's do it. And he was like cheering me on and stuff. Um, and I'm really thankful for him. We have been fighting for like a couple of tournaments. In the past and it was really nice to see that he's like cheating for me in that moment yeah and you just absolutely throw the absolute perfect shot on on hole 18. that was beautiful did you did you was that your play all all three rounds to be that aggressive off the tee or were you a little bit more aggressive knowing that you have to birdie that hole <laughs> i was even more aggressive on, hole, on round one i think i threw like pd and i know now i threw fd so that's like seven speed okay uh, I went OB, OB right on round two, so I was going just like a bit more stable, so I can go like a bit more flatter, and yeah, I threw it very good. Yeah, it was it was incredible, and then, like you said, I think the way you ended it with that big, uh, you know, thirty five footer, I think that is to me that's like the icing on the cake versus you know you throwing your upshot to five feet. I'm sure you would yeah. take both. But looking yes. back at it, knowing that if you were going to make both of them, the 35 footer, let's be real. Like that was epic. The emotion that you showed after making it, like what, what is all that like going through? I mean, you're, you're not like a, you're not like an old guy. It's not like you've been on yeah. tour trying to win forever. So like, wh where did that emotion come from? Um, I think there's many things that like affect the moment. I think also the, but the fact that I was second last week and it was so close and I threw OB on 17 and kind of lost the tournament on that hole. And also that there have been so many times that I'm in the backyard putting uh, and I imagine like, all right, Nicholas, this is for the win in a big tournament. And I was just thinking like, if I make this putt, I would be so happy after all those second places and all those close calls and mistakes in the in the like right moment so i felt like so relieved i would say did your phone blow up after you won because i don't it, i mean what time was it over in, in finland it had to have been super early right were people yeah. watching you it was like 3 a.m but all my family all my friends they were up watching and yeah oh, it that's was cool it was absolutely crazy yeah wow that's nuts that is that is very 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 cool um all right, we got a couple. Uh, a well, couple. Got, oh yeah, go ahead, Yuli. Yeah, 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 go for it. What about like so? Finland's obviously this country that just loves disc golf. It's so popular over there, and and obviously being the best player right now over there, you and Vino. Mm -hmm. Who are your like heroes? You know what I mean? To, to where now yeah. you can look at yourself and and you can be like, oh my gosh, all these guys before me came and tried to win on the tour. And they couldn't do that. And, you know, I'm the lucky one that got to go out there and, and, and get this yeah. done for, for anybody. Like who, who are the guys that you looked up to and you were like, man, I'm never going to be that good. Or I hope I can be that guy someday. Mm -hmm. Like who are the guys that really inspired you from Finland? There's many guys. Um, 
I I think I would say Seppo is the biggest one for me. Uh, he was very good when I was starting this golf in like 2015 or 2016. Uh, also, Pasi Koivu, uh, Jussi Meresma, and uh, even Väinö. Väinö was very good as well when I started, and he still is. And it was it was funny because Seppo kind of took Väinö to U.S. for the first time and kind of made Väinö feel, feel good in U.S. and stuff. And then Väinö took me to here uh, in 2022, and now I want the tournament for Finland. So it feels like I made Finland proud, maybe. <laughs> Not maybe. Yes, you did. <laughs> how how has that been? You know, transitioning from playing, you know, e even in Europe, playing around Europe to now, you know, you're not. I don't know how long you're planning on being over here before you go back. Like, how how is the travel? How is how is being away from home for that long? Yeah, I usually do like anything between like eight to twelve weeks. Uh, it's a long time to be away from home and family and stuff. Um, I'm doing like more flying back and forth this year, so I will do three trips and uh, I will actually have more, more tournaments in US than last year, but I will fly more. And uh, I feel like playing in Europe has been like different for me always. And now I finally feel like the disco is feeling the same for me in US right now. So mm. it makes me like, play a lot better obviously uh i need to think as much and i feel more like at home in us right now what, what were some of the differences like what were some of the things that made that stood out to you of like hey this is different than what it feels like playing in europe uh i think everything uh, i'm so far away from home it's like 15 hours uh of traveling to get back home uh, language is different. You don't, you guys don't even understand me all the time because of my English <laughs> and stuff. Um, you're doing a great job, by the way. There was a couple comments on here too saying it's very impressive that you know your second language jumping on a podcast and talking with <laughs> us. So you're doing a yeah, fantastic thank, job. Thank you. Yeah, it's almost everything. Food is different. Um, almost everything. But I finally feel like uh, I'm almost like playing in Finland, if that makes sense. And it makes me like just focus on disc golf and don't think about anything else than playing the tournament. We do have what Cinnabon about... here though, Nicholas. We do have <laughs> yeah, Cinnabon. Do. And Chipotle. <laughs> yeah, yes. Chipotle. Yeah. Favorite ones. <laughs> um, I, I like about... the American Ford. It's good. What about, <laughs> what about this? I really wanted to ask you this question. So coming into like this tournament, you obviously lost the weekend before and you've had some second places, USDGC, comes to mind um but you're also playing against the best players in the world that's one thing that the u.s does have is the pro tour right and so mm -hmm. everybody anybody can win any any single weekend and you have these monsters like ricky and gannon and Macbeth and kyle klein and all these guys um did you in your mind are you thinking like no i'm a monster i'm like these guys like this is where i belong this is who i am and like, what is that like playing against them and being like, for example, like you're kind of short in stature and you're a little bit mm -hmm. unassuming and the um, Finland culture is very quiet and you guys are so humble in your approach to the game, which is nice. Cause then when you win, you know, that mm -hmm. electric uh, um, celebration was awesome for all of us because we see the calm, cool Nicholas mm -hmm. and then you win and then the emotion comes out. So I, I feel like in America, like we're all kind of like a little bit cocky, you know what I mean? All the time, mm -hmm. all the time. Like we wear our confidence on our sleeves mm -hmm. and it's hard to tell with you guys, like inside is Nicholas like, no, I'm a beast. Like these guys can't hang with me or, or do you have a lot more respect for their games and stuff? And you just kind of go through a process a different way. Um. I feel like when I started playing in like 2015, uh, I was watching like all the YouTube and stuff, and I was watching you, uh, Paul, Ricky, all those guys, and they were like so good, so good, and I was like trying to copy Paul's path or Paul's backhand or anything, and they are like my my idols and my heroes, and. Now that I'm here, uh, I feel like in 2022, I knew that 
I can do good here, but maybe not win yet. Um, and then last year I felt like I'm coming closer. Uh, and I know that I can win if I do a good tournament and a good weekend. But now I feel more like um, if I play just okay, I will be in top 10 or top 15. I don't need to like do anything anything crazy to like be in contention for the win. And that's important for me because if you get those chances often, you're also going to win, win some of those. And uh, that's how I look at the game at the moment. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was cool. One of the coolest posts I saw was actually from Ricky Wysocki, who mm -hmm. had a picture of you kind of looking at him. And then the caption was was awesome. It was, uh, welcome to the winner's circle. We've been waiting <laughs> on you. How did, that, how did that feel? I thought that was absolutely awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Actually, I played my first tournament uh, in the U.S. That was Texas State in 2022. And I was playing with Ricky then. And he said to me that, just continue doing what you're doing. You are very good and you will win here in the US. He said, said that to me in 2022 and I'm very thankful to him. He's like one of the best in the sport to ever play and he's pushing me forward with that. That's awesome. That's love so it. cool. Yeah, I love, I love that, uh, you know, the Pro Tour is still so young, yeah. but we get to we're going to experience more and more of these like cool memories cool stories of players passing the torch like one day you're gonna probably do the same thing right yeah. you're gonna see a new up-and-comer coming on tour and say something the same so it's so cool that we are we're in this spot right now of where i mean we've been talking about it on this show of where you know heck 30 40 people can win any given tournament now yeah. And then also like you, you, you know, bogey one hole, you're not dropping from third to fourth. You could drop from third to outside the top 10 sometimes. Like yeah. it's, there's so many good players now. It's, it's very, very exciting times uh, for disc golf. Yes. All right. A couple, a uh, couple listener questions here. They wanted to know, first one is uh, how did you acquire your unique, your unique throwing form? All right. So, as I said, I was trying to do like Paul McBeth was throwing um, when I started playing. And in my mind, I felt like I looked just like Paul. And then I was, <laughs> then I was recording my, my throw and it was like so different. <laughs> um, so Paul has been like a big part uh, of my throwing style. Even though they don't look the same, but I feel like we can control the disc the same way. We throw like, we are not throwing like, 95% on every shot, we like tempo down on some of the shots and control those fairway drivers pretty good. So Paul has been a big role model for me and also Simon. Simon was also like throwing Europe that time and he was throwing super far. And those two guys are like my main guys when like starting to learn techniques. Well, that leads me into my next question. This is coming from Kevin. He wants to know what is your max distance? Really curious how much you can get with that smooth form? I think I can do like 500, like on a golf line. That's like almost my max. And there's been so many people telling me that you need to throw farther if you go to the US and stuff. And I always told, told them that if I place them on the fairway and make my putts, you don't need to throw like 550 to win those tournaments. Mm -hmm. If you just stay in bounds and do you, I think that's all you need to do. Germ had a great call about your form. He says uh, that you're rocking the disc to sleep because it's so smooth. <laughs> I love, I love that. Oh, you know, that's a good it looks line. Like he's rocking it, rocking the baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. He says that he's rocking the disc to sleep. Oh I my god! I yeah. That was, I thought that was amazing. Very good line. All right, one of uh, fans' favorite segments here. We get to dig in a little bit and and really kind of see what gets under your skin so right. what are your biggest pet peeves i need to charge my phone i have a three percent oh. i'm bad oh my there bad. you go all good all right that's a I'm, huge I'm pet peeve is when the Sorry. phone goes yeah. dead <laughs> <laughs> the, the, so the question is uh like what are things either when you're playing in tournaments or casual mm -hmm. rounds or anything what are some of your biggest pet peeves Things that like you just can't stand. You don't know why they mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. I think 
Number one might be the like moving slowly, like walking slowly. We spoke about that in the beginning. Okay. Uh, that's annoying. Um, then, if you don't let uh, like a faster group play play through you, or like if there's like four people playing and there's one guy coming from behind, um, it's annoying if you not to like play behind behind those. Then, what was the third one? I know I have something that's super annoying. <laughs> uh, I just know if I ever get a chance where we're playing, I'm just going to moonwalk to my, all my discs to really annoy yeah. you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Slowly just walking backwards to my disc. <laughs> I, I saw your latest episode and somebody said pump fakes and that's also annoying, but I do it myself. So I don't know if I can say that or no. <laughs> that, yeah, that's also annoying. I would say pump fakes. I'm sorry, guys. No, I think, I think pump fakes are fine. It's, it's just when, like, we were talking about, and, and again, your putt on hole 14, mm -hmm. that that is a different situation than the second hole of a tournament from 15 feet, right? Like, yeah. those two things are very, yeah. very different. And they should, they should be, uh, they should also be, I think, um, handled differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think we should be trying to rush the very end of a tournament. Like yeah. that's when the drama builds. That's when you can yeah. build that story. Um, but that's... if we're on the second hole brother and you got a 10 footer and you're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, this round's going to be a nightmare. We're, we're in <laughs> yeah. for one here. Yeah. Um, all right. Yuli, he kind of answered his question a little bit with the throwing, but there might be another answer here. So yeah. go ahead. Out of everybody on tour right now, who do you look at and, it could be any part of the game and you're like, Oh man, that's nice. Like I'm a little jealous of that guy. Like who do you look at on tour and you're like any, it can be it, anything. It has to be a B. Uh, <laughs> it's always a B. This, like, yeah. It's always a I know, B. I know it's a boring answer, but he's just, it, when he's throwing far, it's just like, I don't know what's happening. It's like, <laughs> I can do, I can do like half of that, what he's doing. So yeah. If I had that, I would be so good. <laughs> he also does it in such a way where it doesn't look like the way he looks when he throws in distance contests is vastly different than the way he throws in tournaments, yeah. but he still throws so much farther than everyone in tournaments. So it's like, yes, he's got that extra gear that, you know, and you're still watching him just like probably throw 90% and you're just like, geez, Louise, it just yeah. comes out of that pocket so quick. Well, and it's yeah. crazy because his down tempo is so good now. Like he's yes. throwing those Novas and he's just going like walking up three step poof and it's going 350 and you're like, how can somebody who has that much touch mm -hmm. then on the next hole throw it 512 feet on a Spike Kaiser with a Nuke OS? Yeah. Like, because, does it, it's not fair. Yeah, because I know so many guys that throw like as far as AB does, at least like almost, but they like, they have no touch. They can throw like slow, and uh, I also feel like AB is like using the distance he has to his advantage on the course, mm -hmm. uh, and that's like that's a very good one. All right, I want to leave you before you go here. I want to leave you with a couple stats. This is coming from Edwin Stats here, our st statistician. Um, you may or may not know these, but you are actually the fourth European to win an MPO Elite event. You are the third player since 2019 to ace and win in the same event. Uh, the other two being Conrad, James Conrad, Worlds 2021, yeah. and Paul McBeth, uh, MVP Open 2020. So that's a nice little group that you're a part nice. of. And then you, uh, your 66% birdie rate, that is the highest birdie rate of 2024. Only two players had a higher birdie rate at an elite event in all of 2023. Uh, that's Ricky Wysocki, who birdied 68% of the, the holes at Preserve, and Cole Dolan, who birdied 67% of the holes at Waco. So you oh. uh, you buried a lot of holes this past week, and apparently that's what you need to do to win out here. So keep yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah, and then you're gonna also double bogey hole six when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hold yeah. that. I'm gonna hold that to you. I'm, I'm never gonna let you forget hole number six when you yes. pulled out that driver. I was like, what is he doing right now? Yeah, um, yeah. 
I but hey, sometimes you got to be aggressive to win it, and you clearly did. So, uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of, the, out of your day, out of your night, to join us on Tour Life. I know all of our listeners really appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the best going forward. Enjoy your week off if you aren't playing anything this week, and uh, we'll see you at Texas States, brother. All right, thank you guys here in Houston. Safe travels. There you have it, the 2024 Open at Austin champion, Nicholas Intella.